What do you believe is the safest form of pest control when farming in an urban environment? All right, so I don't believe in the use of pesticides at all um, that are not organically derived. So there's two top favorites that I have, and that's going to be neem oil and diatomaceous earth. Neem oil is actually made from the neem seed, which is a tree. It comes from a tree. It's an evergreen tree. And we're able to um, extract the oil from those seeds and dilute it with water and spray different plants. There's some plants and some herbs that you're not going to want to spray with neem oil for certain reasons. But it does really good with things like mildew. Um, it's also a fungicide, so if you're dealing with fungus on the leaves of your plants. And it's also going to deter things like a tomato hornworm, uh, things like the white fly, um, aphids pests that are super common in household gardening and large-scale farming. Um, and it's an all-natural way that you can just spray the plants safely and then consume safely after they've been harvested and washed. Diatomaceous earth works a little differently. Um, it's actually made from these super fascinating organisms called diatomes. And diatomes are aquatic organisms. When they die, their exoskeleton is what's left behind. And it's what we know in the modern day, it's called silica. So we use this, it's a powder, and it looks like clay. We mix that with water, and we'll spray our plants with it. Um, certain plants do better with diatomaceous earth because it's going to help deter pests that have a harder exoskeleton. So identifying what the pests you're managing are is really important before you choose your organic means of um, an herbicide. Uh, jumping back to the neem, what plants don't t do well with neem so viewers know? Sure, yeah. So some of like the softer leaf herbs like basil, oregano, I wouldn't use neem oil on. Um, sometimes it can be harsher on the actual plant skin as well, um, with the sun as well burning it. Um, I would steer away from using neem oil on those herbs. What things grow well in your area that you use? Oh, a lot grows well. We have super sacred land um, in the heart of North Philadelphia. Um, some of our most popular things that we grow that thrive are collards. We grow a variety of collards. Um, this year we grew green glazed collards. Michael Twitty writes about green glazed collards in a book that he recently came out with um, as the preferred collard green if we're growing. It has a beautiful uh, shiny finish on the leaves. It's actually more pest deterrent than the commercialized collard that we see that's more locally available um, in markets. We really like that it thrived this year. Kale is thrives in our land. We do curly kale, red Russian kale, dino or lacinato kale, um, tomatoes, peppers, basil, oregano, uh, even corn. We grow a variety of corn. Right now we're growing some purple Peruvian corn specifically to harvest the antioxidant properties that are found in that purple expression through anthocyanins. Yeah. So when the corn itself comes to fruition, we'll take the whole cob and dry it and grind that up into a powder, which you can then use in smoothies, etc. And it's using the corn in a versatile way. Mm -hmm. Some people might grow sweet corn as well, which is delicious for some folks, but what we're doing is intentionally growing to harvest the most nutrients possible in an earth-given crop, and that is purple Peruvian corn. And these are just some of the things that we see thrive. We grow through all the seasons at Life Do Grow Farm, and right now we're transitioning into our fall crops. Uh, since fruits have pores, right, like the human skin absorb what's put on them, is it possible to rid fruits of harmful pesticides? Yeah, so the plain answer I can give is no. There is no way to 100% remove harmful pesticides from the fruits and vegetables that are being sprayed with them in commercial growing spaces. My best advice for folks is to buy food that has not been sprayed with pesticides that are harmful to us. There are methods you can use. I've seen a variety of methods online and I've used a variety of methods myself. You can take about two tablespoons of baking soda and mix that with water. Um, I'm not sure the exact ratio, but let's say two tablespoons to two cups and then you, know, you can increase that depending on how much fruit you have to wash. You can use things like apple cider vinegar. I've seen that as well for washing the fruit. 
but there's nothing that's going to take it out 100% from these fleshy fruits that we're seeing being sprayed with chemicals that are forever chemicals. Um, there is just no way. And for viewers, can you clearly explain what fleshy fruits are? Yes, sure. So things like a strawberry, things even like a tomato. These things have the ability to absorb um, anything that's sprayed on them. They're very interactive with the outer world around them. Um, but fruits are more sensitive. Um, so when we think of things like berries, they have a very thin skin compared to something um, with a shell, like a nut or something like that. All of these things grow, but the way they're protected from their outer environment is different. And things like fruits, the bugs and the pests they love the most, they're the most easily accessible for them as well. So these harmful pesticides are trying to deter the bugs from even biting through that flesh. Um, and if we think about it on a nature scale, why would we want to consume something that these uh, insects or pests don't want to consume? Um, these are on micro levels. These chemicals that are being sprayed onto these fruits and vegetables are deterring things. When we, by nature, if we were to go up to this fruit or this vegetable, we would not want to eat it after it had just been sprayed with pesticides. Just because it's been X amount of time since it was originally sprayed doesn't change the fact that the fruit was actually able to absorb some of that. And then we, our bodies, absorb it too. What is the route to go to kind of protect yourself from getting fruits that are highly saturated in pesticides? Growing your own, and that can be difficult depending on what region you're in. So we're in the 7B region, that's a growing region that has been signified as where we grow in Philadelphia. Right now we have two different types of raspberries. We have blackberries, we have a peach tree, um, we have an elderberry tree, we have a pear tree, we have an apple tree. These are all things that we're able to grow hyper-locally. It's going to take a little more time because fruits sometimes will take longer than other crops to actually come to fruition and give you the fruits of the plant's labor. Um, one tree that I feel like doesn't get enough recognition, it's a fruit tree in North America, is the pawpaw tree. So we have about three or four pawpaw trees at the farm and pawpaws were a fruit that at some time in history didn't make the cut compared to fruits like apples. Um, they don't ship as well, um, they get bruised pretty easily and they're less aesthetically pleasing to consumers after they've been traveling for some time and I believe that's the reason why you know they're not seen as widely available but the pawpaw tree thrives in North America and when we think about what our ancestors were growing and eating in this land, the folks indigenous to this land we're on now in Lenape Hoking, the pawpaw tree was um, a pivotal fruit for them to honor and know as a sacred tree that would always prov provide fruit for them to then eat. Um, so also looking into what fruits are hyper-local to your environment naturally and choosing to eat them. Uh, what are your thoughts on about organic labeling in supermarkets? Uh, yeah, I think that organic labeling has become popularized. I think that there are many different things it can mean. We at the farm do not have an organic seal. Um, one thing that I try and educate folks on is to receive an organic seal. There has to be money involved. So that brings us back into this capital capitalist scheme of food systems that do not serve our people. So for us to be able to be recognized on a larger growing scale as an organic farm, we actually would have to pay money even to submit an application to become recognized as organic. So for myself, I recognize that there's barriers in place that prevent marginalized communities from even acquiring such a seal. And for me personally, if I know that I've grown it and it's organic or a local farm has, that's enough for me.